Thank you so much, Rico. I am so glad to be here and sharing with you today. Um, we started Blue Banyan with the intention of really bringing the best um, thoughts and intelligence that we could into the world so that all of this high-end technology, things that have typically been very difficult to implement, can actually make it all the way down to small business owners and small and medium-sized business owners so that everyone can benefit from what used to be high-tech and very exclusive options and outcomes. So when we're looking at the post-digital future, there are three main things that we need to focus on. This road is hard in that it's got potholes, but there is a road now on how to actually do this. And so I'm going to teach you about how to and talk to you about how to do the different um, potholes and address them so that you can smooth along the side here and not have such a bumpy road. So the first thing that we do anytime that we're talking about how to lay this out for a new company that's looking at it is we actually really make a pictorial roadmap. <laughs> we draw a picture of it and we want to categorize a couple features in here that I want to show you. And this is an example. This example does use uh, NetSuite as the ERP, but it could be any ERP system. So what we want people to understand is that there are different tools that help the system be useful and then channels. And these are typically sales channels and we put them in green because this is where the sales are coming from. And these will flow to an ERP system, which may or may not have a separate 3PL system. And then it can go in optionally into an additional data warehouse with some more tools to look at it and evaluate that data. But by looking at all of the options in a way that you've got columns and you're comparing like options to each other, really does a lot to reduce a lot of the anxiety around change management. So, so colors and pictures, and it sounds simple, but it actually makes a huge difference. This is usually where most of the growth comes from. The heavy lifting and setting up your ERP and 3PLs and getting your basics working here is nowhere near the level of effort for adding a new channel. And so as you see different diagrams that look really complex, usually they're just adding additional channels into their core backbone. And this will be a principle that we see over and over again. So that is the overview for how to do the roadmap of the first step. And so let's take a minute and talk about integrations. So when you want to get into big e-commerce plays, almost always the first thing that you do is talk to a developer. And developers really like, and they are able to build an integration with an API to anything. You can't connect anything to anything with code. And Blue Banyan is super technical, so we tend to be very biased this way. We have shifted to using IPaaS and Subligo for all of our integrations that we can for a couple key reasons. First is that when it is code-based, it's very hard to maintain. You have to have somebody who's actually trained in how to utilize this in order to understand arrays and structures and make these loops work, right? It's also much more time consuming in your ability to respond quickly to customers, to have an idea, execute, and see the results, experiment and see if this new brand and this new take on maybe a similar product line or a subset of your product line now to see if it is actually appealing in this new light. You, it, it takes a long time to do the integration. You're not gonna get that experimentation and prototyping effect that you need. When you do it by hand, it's very rigid for changes and you have to take the programmers to do it. So it leads to breaks and actual downtime. And usually that downtime comes when you least expect or want it, like say on Black Friday. So it is very important that we not <laughs> get there too far. And last, it requires technical resources to build. And I don't know how you all are getting hit by the, the great um, resignation, but it is a tremendous shift in keeping these technical resources. They are high demand, especially good ones. And so 
all of this together makes us want to lead to doing a cloud-based system. So a cloud-based system is where we're moving the data. We need to have clear processes, but then we have a service-oriented architecture so that we can integrate to all those applications. And this sounds technical, but what it ends up providing is that both IT and non-IT people can maintain the systems. As you heard, I'm sure that Melissa, Mike, and Jeff are all power users in their systems, and they're able to make changes and adjustments and manage those independent of needing to involve any kind of vendor or even just any kind of internal service person that they need to have grow their business. That has a huge impact on your adaptability as your business grows. So we do, despite being technical, we do actually all of these integrations through IPASS now. So the main benefits, you can deploy faster, you can experiment, you can try different things. It's easier to maintain and power users who can surprise you. Sometimes it's an intern and sometimes it's your CFO. You never know exactly who gets into this, but they do have the ability to maintain the flows. And the last big adva advantage is the single pane of glass. So we use this concept for error management and troubleshooting. You've got one place that you can go and see what has been successful or what exactly hasn't, and you can proactively catch errors, then you actually prevent a cascade of downstream effects. When you just have an error and you can catch it within 30 minutes, it's no big deal, the item flows through, the customer probably doesn't even notice, it flows right on through the warehouse and everything is fine. If it got resolved in the same day, usually within a few minutes. But if this kind of, if you've got an item error in a product that had a typo or some special character in it or something that made the flow break and you don't catch it and that customer order doesn't actually make it into the system, then you don't know and you sell out the product from underneath of them, then when it finally does get recognized and fixed after they've complained two weeks later, you don't have the product left anymore, you have like this cascade of problematic situations. So having the single pane of glass so that we can train users to check every single day to see what's going on and fix it real time in the same day before it becomes a problem is an absolute game changer. So these are all the reasons why we have this first set to that mindset that we're gonna do integrations first. Here's an example of a template that comes and the key flows from a storefront to an ERP. And you'll see that it's actually kind of involved. There's quite a bit of information that you need to get to the storefront and keep in sync with what your backend accounting is doing and having this come right out of the box so that it can get implemented in days or a couple weeks instead of months is absolutely amazing. So the next challenge is around the data. So let's take a minute and think about what this data, a whole bunch of the automation, I think in, as we add in AI, is gonna help us <laughs> primarily manage our data issues. So that I think as technology people, we all this fantasy that eventually we'll get out of data entry and not need to do that. But it is a long time away. And there are some key things that we do when we set up our data that makes it easy, determines if it's gonna be easier or harder to manage. So the main thing, the first thing when we you know, are talking to a new client about how to do their e-commerce strategy in an automation first perspective is we talk about the item master. The item master is like the central hub of the wheel and everything else connects into it. So everything about your item master will become key to the strength of your business as a whole. We often use the item master to develop this human readable and repeatable information flow for the item for developing a common SKU so that all of the key attributes about that item are clear and can be decoded by someone who is in the know, like an employee or a vendor or someone, a regular customer who's working with you on a regular basis. 
and having these human readable SKUs it makes all the difference in the world because they can tell you right off the bat if something looks right or wrong or they can know if they are ordering the thing they really intended to order and a variety of cues and errors get handled just by having your SKU and your data set up in a way that's human readable and they can tell that you made a difference. Um, this is actually key to setting up how main e-commerce strategies work. And you really still need to follow IT rules, you know, information management rules for how this is set up. One of the key ones is one field, one fact. We need to make sure that every field that you're going to represents only one fact and you're not combining information in any particular way. This often happens with categories where you combine multiple pieces of information and then you're not sure if you should use that category or this one and there's a lot of subjectivity can enter into the process and that creates a challenge on an ongoing basis. So you need to have one field, one fact and complete unique sets. We actually use those like they're terms in a Bible and reference them all the time. They're the main mental models. But when you do that, you're able to get a common nomenclature for exactly which facts you're talking about. So you're always talking apples to apples. And you can set up these templates that eliminate data errors because you know you've got a complete unique set of statuses or you've got a complete unique set of colors that you're going to be using. So setting up this item master is a huge game changer in how you set things up in your data and is the place to spend the time and get it right. Here's an example of someone who's done it well. And I bet everybody on the call knows about as much about deadbolts as I do. But you can see that this is an outline of all of the key selling features of a deadbolt. It's actually the SKU structure itself is inherently educational about what it is that you ought to be looking for and how you would know what is different or better about a specific item. And then you can see the detail and understand how you would lock that in yourself. So this helps customers pick the right thing that they actually need the first time, or it helps vendors uh, make sure that they're delivering what it is that you need. And it gives everybody, and even this isn't as human readable as some might be. Here's an example of different values but it is clear enough and well understood across the industry that it got adopted. And it is referenced in all of these other websites as the main character, the main way that you know exactly what it is that you're getting across multiple brands and websites. This is a huge long-term market shifting advantage to set up a common SKU that has got the details and the information that you need. So this is the, they, there are many things around data that you can fix, but this is our number one secret tool to help you succeed. Let's get that item master. And last is the processes. You really do need a common process map. We call it a blueprint for everything that you're gonna do in your business going forward. It becomes the backbone by which you measure how well people know what they're supposed to do and are actually doing it, just like Jeff was talking about. And it also measures, um, it just gives you the clarity that you need to know as you add in extra systems, whether or not you're actually doing it right. So the key to knowing if you have done your process work well enough is that it needs to go through what's called the CRUD analysis. And I know that's a terrible word, it sounds awful, but it's a mental model that was developed in the 60s by computer science people. And it stands for create, read, update, and delete. So you need to be able to know across each of your systems, which system can create, read, update, and delete that item, because it's gonna change how you set up your flows and what you can expect from your flows over time. So if you've got customers and if NetSuite were your ERP, you could do everything with these customers here in NetSuite, but you'll notice that includes deleting. 
and that's not available anywhere else. And then on your e-commerce site, you can create a brand new customer. So how are you gonna get back that back to NetSuite? How are you gonna make sure that they have terms if they need terms? How are you gonna make sure that that works? You need to think through those processes in advance. They have readability. That means that if a customer is created someplace else, that they can still access it in BigCommerce. So you get this omni-channel experience for your customers. And then what if they update their shipping address? How are you gonna get that shipping address back into the main customer record so that it's available when they call into customer service to see how things are going overall? So this CRUD analysis is, is pretty much the way that we make sure that we go through and have actually identified all of the processes that we need to automate and that we fixed. So I'm giving you our, our tips and tricks for how to make sure you've got completeness in your process management and thinking. The next piece, which I think is a really fun way of looking at how you're going to do the automation, and this is an excellent way to phase things and criteria to use for that phasing. So the first is as you identify repetitive tasks, that is actually the low hanging fruit for all automation. So you identify how often this task happens and then automate it you know, wherever you can. This is actually the number one low hanging fruit main thing to do. The second that once that's happened and you need to get a little more subtle about how you're gonna do this, is you need to define your business goals. So um, I was very impressed that Melissa was talking at the body art that she's got accounting and payments as part of her business goals. And Mike has got the shipment to the door part of his business goals. And Jeff was really focused on the customer experience. And so they had an area that they were using as their main focus. Then they selected the right workflow, an automation solution. They trained the users to use them and it's really important as you're adding automation that your current users who are doing it manually understand how that automation works. Like they understand what the criteria is for triggering the automation. And in that way, they can become your partner together to make sure that you're doing the right thing and that the automation is doing the right thing every time. Because when it gets first gets started, probably it isn't. And so you need them to understand how this automation works so it doesn't feel random and out of control and they get trained and then they get on board. Once you've got this tuned up and in place, you need to keep measuring. And it is nice to measure some of your technical aspects, but the main thing to measure is did you hit these business goals? So defining your business goals and measuring against whether or not you, you hit those goals and what impacts you're actually having on customer satisfaction scores or quicker accounting closes or what it is that you're gonna to use to, to define success in this area. And out of this, we'll find more repetitive tasks. And then once you've actually digested and gone through the cycle, you can start the next one and look at the next business goals. But I use this process to help define what's gonna have the biggest impact for the least amount of effort um, when going through and looking at businesses. And take the time to digest it and get all the way through the cycle because it will take some time before you want to, to head off. One of the key uh, terms that we use or phrases that we have inside Blue Banyan is that you need to start finishing and stop starting because there's so many cool new ideas and automations and options out there right now that it's really important that you get the thing all the way across the finish line before you start the next one so that you have a foundation of these incremental changes whose benefits will compound over time and give your business the lift that you're looking for. So I included this because I love this chart. These are the most common areas for business process automation improvement. So the first thing of just knowing that you wanna do bottlenecks and getting things to process faster is actually a fabulous business goal. That then you can get some really creative ideas about how it is that you might um, make things go faster. One of the 
incidents that came up that I, I found was interesting that was shifted a bias I had as a technology person originally is that I kind of thought that in order to fix high incidents of errors that required rework, this one down here, you had to have all your data perfectly right up front. And that would give you the best, fastest experience as you move through the chain. And sometimes that's right, and sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes if you know enough that you know that as customers in you know, an urban area, so there will be delivery service and that's sufficient to be able to assign the right kind of delivery truck, you don't need to know everything or have everything confirmed in order to be able to proceed. And having some softer information was one of the ways that we actually eliminated bottlenecks that slowed things down. So I love this chart. Please take a look and see what it is that, that you can um, utilize in your own business circumstance to get these business process automations with the biggest bang for the buck and then actually get them to the finish line and then reevaluate and go forward again. Next, I wanted to show you an example of a blueprint. So here we've got where main focus is actually in big commerce and we're interested in the order being placed and then setting the status correctly for the customer experience. So when it gets placed, we've got a Celigo connection that creates the sales order in NetSuite. Then we give it a cancellation period so they can change their mind. Um, if they do cancel the order, we need it to come all the way back into big commerce as canceled so that everyone is clear that they don't, aren't paying for this and they don't need to pay for it. If they don't cancel it, then we kick off two pronged process. It goes, the order goes into fulfillment for Corber. And then we, once it is actually fulfilled from that 3PL, we need it to come back hourly and shift the status to shift and completed so that the customer can see where their information is at. Simultaneously, we actually kick off the billing in this case. And we do have two options, terms or cash. And if we're gonna do a payment record for either one once we actually receive payments. Returns go through this process, and this is how we end up studying the status as we're funded. So this is how we, looking at our big commerce to get a blueprint for all the statuses that an order can be in, and which systems are playing with that order in order to make that work. And you can see how quickly, typically the longest would be an hour, because we don't want to bulk up our systems with status changes per se, and an hour doesn't make a material difference in our business. But you can actually shift it to on demand in this one. So this is an example of a billing, of a, a blueprint, and you can see that there are choices that were made, and there were decisions that were made about how to simplify and how things are going to work in order to land at a place that's got pretty stable clarity about what's happening and what it means for the entire business. And this is excellent when you, not only for cross-training, knowing where people are doing things, but also for onboarding new people so that they understand what to expect and they understand what you mean when you set each of these statuses. So the key takeaways are for today are we do recommend that you streamline all your integrations so that you can deploy them rapidly, have that ease of maintenance and get that single pane of glass for error management. This is tremendous in moving fast, but also removing dependencies off of an IT team, which is almost always strained. Second, do optimize your data. It is worth taking the time, especially to create this kind of smart skew. It gives you marketing advantages, data management advantages, and it can actually make you a thought leader in your industry. And third, add process automations as you scale to continually increase your productivity. These benefits will compound and it is absolutely amazing, but they only compound if they actually get done. They need to cross the finish line and then you move to the next one and you'll experience the benefits. So I welcome anyone to come talk with Blue Banyan and hear more about 
how, you know, if it sounds like we could partner with you and help out, we are um, partner of the year for our micro vertical solution. We do are a Sligo Platinum provider and we do actually provide our own apps and develop our own technology as well. Thank you. I am wondering, Rico, if there are any questions. There are, um, and hopefully we can turn my camera. Um, there we go. Um, hopefully we can uh, hit one or two here before. There's quite a few questions, uh, but maybe let's try to hit one or two before we move on here. Um, okay, one, uh, I mean, it's it's great that both IT and non-IT teams can contribute and that the legal can supply a mechanism for rapid deployment. But as projects grow in complexity, what strategies exist or a plan for change management? Sometimes you need rigidity. A rogue change in the system that one team thinks is totally fine is conceivably weak, uh, can conceivably wreck havoc, uh, havoc on something else. Yes. So my key solution for this is natural consequences. It's a parenting technique. <laughs> but it works best if the people who are maintaining the system and changing the system actually experience the consequences of doing something wrong. And that most often happens in accounting, believe it or not. They really care about the items being right because they experience those problems. And so if you first start, if your non-IT people are an accounting people or somebody who's going to ex experience the effect that's gonna hit across the organization, it might have a marketing effect, it might have a fulfillment effect, but you're gonna to wanna to hit somebody, the people who you're going to give the keys to the kingdom to, to in order to maintain this, need to be people who are owning the whole system and will actually feel the impact of what it is that they're doing if they get it wrong or they do it too quickly. With that, they will learn and they will be more cautious in the future. It is also quick to reverse. So you want to be careful about not being, you do need to be rigid and have change man management, particularly as you get more complex and you may start to develop some internal IT expertise just for that but you also want them to be able to, if it's a reversible change and it's something that they can quickly back out of if they did it wrong, then that's a reason to maybe sacrifice the perfection for the flexibility and moving forward. So all of these things are business calls. There's more of an art than a science to it all. And yes, you do need to balance the pros and cons as you go through. Those are some of my tips on how I balance them. Great. Um, here's another one. I'm using NetSuite ERP. Uh, what more could Celigo enable me, enable me to automate? I heard of managing inventory, shipping, PTO, and more, but that is already handled by NetSuite. So. Right. So managing inventory um, is often managed by NetSuite, so that part is great. The PTO and the hiring with the H. Um, if Sweet People is on there, then you could be handling that through Sweet People. But if you're not, there's ADP integrations. And we do often have like Five9 and other tools that integrate that will give you activity from HubSpot about who's looking at your, your um, sites right now and so who it is that you should call. There's a lot of different extended specialty software around the NetSuite ecosystem that you do want to pull in to give a full view of what's going on in your world. The most, the easiest one to integrate one of them is the HubSpot one to get activity for who's paying attention to you right now, especially if you've got a B2B business and you're gonna be calling them up and seeing, that's one that I've seen a lot of demand for in that zone. And so Lego helps hook all of these different pieces up. Great. Um, I think we probably should move on. I see people, some people are answering here with suggestions of where where else they've uh, automated a search provider, Google feeds and stuff like that. Uh, but we, again, will follow up. So um, thank you so much, Jan, and we will hand it off to Mark to close it out. Really appreciate it. Thank you.